uh, thank you for joining me. If you could do the usual and just give me a shout out in the chat so I know you can hear me. Otherwise, I'll get again. I'll be talking to myself. Uh, so just put yes, you can hear me, something like that in the chat, and that would be brilliant. Thank you very much. Cheers for that, John. Cheers, everybody. Deb, Jay Ross, Sizzle Monkey, Ken. You're good to me. Thank you very much. Mike, don't worry about it, it's free. Don't worry, honestly. <laughs> Eddie, <laughs> great to see you there, mate. And I'm so glad this has got you away from Strictly. We can do it every Sunday if you want, mate, if it helps. Hello and good evening. You've probably just saw me looking down to the right, just making sure that that microphone button is flashing on. So listen, folks, thank you so much for joining me yet again for another one of these uh, uh, email group only webinars. Obviously, they go out live, they go out on YouTube afterwards, but I just like the fact that we can do this live together because I'm loving the stuff that's going on in the chat. That's what this is all about. Uh, but let me just kick off by saying, first of all, thank you for all the, the messages that I've had on social media and replies to the emails uh, to say, well done on the move and enjoy it and I hope you have a good time and all that kind of stuff. But now that I've said that, you might be thinking, this background looks very familiar. 
It looks like it has done for quite some time. And you wouldn't be wrong for thinking that. My Uncle Dave is in the room. Folks, say hello to my Uncle Dave in the room. <laughs> um, you, you wouldn't be wrong in thinking that the background looks the same. I mean, just, let me just briefly explain. We have moved. Um, however, uh, my broadband, my internet, which is kind of like a lifeline for what I do, doesn't get connected in the house until the 19th. So I'm holding on to this place so that I can do this stuff. And the minute the 19th's done and we're all up and running, you'll see a different background. But this is driving me crazy because at the moment, what you can't see outside of this camera view is like a bomb's hit it because all the boxes and everything else are moving. But we're getting there. We are getting there and I am so, so happy to uh, be doing it. But listen, getting on to tonight, um, got loads for you. Uh, here's a rough overview of what we're going to do. Uh, it's called creative composite techniques and what have you. I didn't really know what else to call it. But I'm going to be going through how you can match colour in your composites. When you're adding an element into a background, how can you make it match? We're going to go through that. And then from the thumbnail of the countdown, you saw there was a Spitfire. Some of you are saying, is it a Spitfire or is it a Hurricane? Definitely a Spitfire. Uh, I'm going to show you just some of the stuff that I did when I was making those pictures. Because I did that during the first lockdown. We're now under a second lockdown. Uh, and without doing that kind of stuff, I think I'd have gone a little bit stir crazy. So I want to show you some of the techniques, such as... How do I recreate that exhaust heat kind of effect? How do I make the propellers? And we're also going to look at focus stacking, as well as your time lapses from laps last week. So there's a lot to get through. I forgot my little graphic. I always do that. There's my little graphic, if you knew. This is who I am, and that's where my website is. Um, but uh, let's crack on. Let's crack on. We'll Obviously, we'll have Q&As after each section as well. But I'm going to dive into Lightroom, dive into Photoshop. I think we'll kick off by going through the composite stuff. For those of you who may want to try it while you've got more time in your hands, a bit of a composite. Here's an old picture that I did. It's kind of one, of one of the better ones I've got to demonstrate it. But whatever your picture you're doing it on, this is a great technique for matching the color. But Photoshop being Photoshop, there are loads of other techniques. Let's dive into it now. OK, so the image I'm kind of referring to that I've done is this one here, this superhero character, kind of like a Wolverine character, where he's overlooking uh, a cityscape of the city of London. And if I take you to the partly retouched uh, layers here, so you can see how it's kind of made up, where we've got all these groups of layers here that are doing certain things, like adding in the wall, uh, brightening the spikes on his hands, but also the main one here where it says Wolverine cutout. If I hold down the Shift key and click on the actual layer mask of the cutout, you can see here we have the original. Let's just turn off the wall that I added in. There is the original photograph where I've kind of cropped it to then do the cutout. And you can see that I got him positioned on this DIY kind of workbench. So what I want to do then is match our uh, superhero character with the environment. Because at the moment, I think his skin looks a little bit too warm, considering this is a nighttime scene with what will be a moonlight coming in from the top left. So here's what we're going to do. I'm going to click on the layer that contains the Wolverine cutout. And then I'm going to go to the adjustment layers in the top right hand corner of the screen and choose a curves adjustment layer. Now, one thing I need to make sure that we do with this is that the adjustments we make now with the curves only affect our superhero character. We do not want them to affect the background. So what I need to do is to add what's called a clipping mask. And we can see now in the properties for this curves adjustment, the icon at the bottom here says uh, it's a clipping mask so when i click on that you'll notice that in the layers panel it moved over slightly to the right hand side and we've now got this down facing arrow which basically means that whatever i now do with this curves adjustment it will only affect the layer directly beneath now it's really important when we now do this process as well that we can see at the moment the layer mask has got the kind of frame around it to say that's what we're working on we need to click actually on the icon for the curve so you can see now we click on that that is where we need the changes to be made not on the layer mask okay so come to the properties now for the curves we've got this auto option so on my mac i'm going to hold down the option key if i was on windows i'd hold down the alt key and then click on the auto button and when we do that we get the auto color correction options and in here this is basically where the default settings are for Photoshop so that it knows what color it needs to make the shadows and what color it needs to make the highlights or basically what color not to go beyond otherwise it starts to lose information. So uh, whilst we're in here we also have the algorithms 
we need to make sure that we have the find dark and light colors option as active so to match the colors then what i'm going to do is tell photoshop what i think the shadow color should be and also what the highlight color should be so to do that making sure that over in the layers panel my frame is around the icon for the curves and not on the layer mask i'll then click on the color for shadows and when I click on that it brings up the color picker and in brackets you can see there it says the target shadow color what do we want the shadows to look like I'll then be my cursor into the picture and you can see as I do that it turns into a color picker and let's just go down now onto a dark area of the background not an area that's completely black but an area that's got a bit of color in it and I think I actually might choose a part of this wall here that's got a bit of color and we'll go for something around about there. Now when I do that you'll see it kind of makes a change to your uh, subject which you might not think is right but bear with me we haven't quite finished this particular technique just yet but all I'll do for now is just click on OK. Then I'm going to come in and choose highlights. When I click on highlights click on the color it brings up the color picker for the target highlight color and now I'm going to choose something that's got a little bit of blue in it because obviously we want it to match in with the uh, background of the sky and the actual cityscape so I might even click on a little bit of the blue in the sky just here and when I do that you can see that it really does darken the image down maybe a little bit too much so you could always kind of brighten it up just a little bit by coming in now into the color picker and kind of playing around exactly where it is it gives us first of all our target color we can now kind of finesse it so we'll then click OK. So this is what we've got at the moment. We can now click OK on that. Uh, then we get this target, this, this uh, dialog box that's basically coming up saying, look, you've played around with Photoshop's default color settings, its target color settings for these shadows and highlights. Do you want to keep those? You definitely do not want to keep them. So make sure at this point here, you click on No. So Photoshop will always know to, to go back to what it should have as opposed to the new settings that you've got. So here we go. We've kind of made a bit of a change so far. If we turn this curves adjustment off and on, we can see that there. But I want to add a little bit of contrast in it. So now in the curves properties, we can see the red, green and blue lines here indicating where the uh, red, green and blue color is how it's been affected. We can see that it's kind of lifted up and come down on the right hand side there. So this is how it's changed as opposed to being from top right bottom. Now I'm going to click on the white line which is the composite line and I'm going to click on that to create a bit of an S curve so we can add a little bit more contrast onto our Wolverine character. So let's just click on there like so and we'll come down here just add a little bit of contrast in there as well. So let's just keep it like that. I can also then come in because this is an adjustment layer I can also lower the opacity or opacity rather to kind of control how much we want so let's have a look now at what this has done for us bring it up just a touch more I'll probably bring it around about 85 so now we can turn this curves adjustment off before after before and after so it's kind of now blending much more into the environment looking a little bit more realistic and even more so I guess if we have a bit of a, a light in the top left hand corner which would indicate where the lights coming on his back so I'll do that by adding a new blank layer I'll get a brush a nice soft round brush so we go for 0% hardness I'll press X on my keyboard to make sure that my foreground color is white and we can just sort of dab down there like that at the moment let's just go to free transform to increase the size of this just a little bit something like that there we go and then we're going to change the blend mode of this let's call this layer here moon light there we go and we'll change the blend mode from normal to overlay so now you can see as i move it around we've got this nice light in the top left hand corner which looks like it's kind of peeking through uh, the clouds as well so a bit of cloud cover rather than just being a normal flat light and in fact if we want that a little bit stronger what we can also do is just hold down the command or control key and press J to duplicate it so it really does look like that moonlight coming in just there. We could also put both of these layers into a group. So let's just go new group from layers. We'll call it moon, at which point we can then just lower the strength of it using that opacity slider as well. 
So that's just one way that you can uh, you can kind of make it look as if the actual elements you're bringing to your composite all match. There's loads of different ways you can do it. But one other thing I didn't mention was the fact that um, your actual thing you're bringing into the composite, a technique I learned from, or a tip rather, that I learned from the most amazing digital artist, a guy called Uli Steiger. If you check out his work, it is just mind blowing. But one thing that he does is really simple to help his subject blend into the background is just lower the opacity of the subject to no, don't lower it any more than like 95%. And just by doing that, it just seems to blend in that little bit more. If you go, you know, increase or decrease the opacity lower than 95%, it then becomes a little bit transparent, which just isn't real. Um, and talking of not being real, that kind of that picture there kind of reminded me of when I was doing a picture of uh, an Iron Man. And I did this pitch and it was part for the one of the films that came out. We did it. The picture was used in Leicester Square. I did the pitch of it and I was getting my wife to come in. To, and I said, so what do you think of this final picture then? And it was Iron Man. She goes, oh, yeah, it's, it's not very realistic though, is it? It's a bloke wearing an iron suit that flies around. <laughs> you can't win, can you? Um, but I also now want to kind of show you just some of the stuff that I, uh, in fact, let's just quickly check if there's any questions there. Uh, Anthony, don't forget the graphic. I presume that <laughs> that was my little lower thirds thing, wasn't it? Um, all right, so if there's no questions on that, let me just, uh, hold on a second, Mike Stapleton. Uh, let's have a look at this one here. Mike, on the Wolverine layer, could you show what the inner glow and gradient overlay look like, as in what it achieves? Uh, the gradient glow, uh, yeah, we can save that. We, we can definitely save that, Mike. I can definitely bring that in. We'll do it on another one, rather than chucking too much in this. But I will make a note of it, mate, and we'll definitely do that. But uh, one that I'll, I'll kind of show you some stuff now to do with the aircraft, extra little techniques. They don't have to be done on aircraft. They can be done on anything, really, that you want to be uh, doing while you're on lockdown and looking to learn new stuff. But the kind of thing I wanted to show you is how I made the propellers, but also that heat effect. Because if ever you've seen, um, if ever you've seen the aircraft kind of, you know, on the in those, a lot of programs lately to do World War II, you'll notice there is that heat that you see coming from the exhaust. And I wanted to recreate that. And you might not even see that really in the final pictures, but I've always believed that it's those small things that you do that make the big difference. You know what I mean? It's the attention to detail that makes the difference. So let me just show you, if there's any questions coming in, in the meantime, I can always dive into them afterwards. But let me just show you how we do, uh, how we do the exhaust fumes. All right, so the kind of thing I'm talking about, if I show you on this picture here, you can kind of see where you've got the uh, exhaust and the sort of nose cone. It's kind of like a rippling effect here, which kind of replicates the look of the heat uh, from the exhaust as the engine's uh, running. But let me just dive over into Photoshop to show you how we do it. Because I've got a partly retouched picture here. And in fact, if I zoom in on this one, you can still see the effect there. Actually, if I just turn the, the propellers on, there you go. Propellers are on there. In fact, what I'll do is I'll show you how to do the exhaust and how to do the propellers. In case you're, uh, you're really thinking you're going to be locked down for a while, you might want to do some of these pictures. But first of all, the actual exhaust stuff there, you do that by using a filter in the filter gallery. But you can see here it's actually greyed out. Now, the reason it's greyed out is because those particular filters within that gallery only work on 8-bit images. And you can see here in the tab that my image is 16-bit image. Now, what I don't want to do is go to the image menu, uh, mode and then change it to 8 bit. I want to maintain as much information, as much detail, detail as I can in this file. So I do not want to change it to an 8 bit. However, what I do as a workaround is this. Uh, we'll go to, let's just take off the heat exhaust heat just there. Uh, I'm going to go to image and duplicate and we'll call this uh, heat and click OK. That then creates an identical version of my image here. So here's the one layer, or sorry, here's one image with all the actual uh, layers, and here's the duplicate with all the same layers as well. You can see in the top here, it's called heat. Now, what I'm actually gonna do here is just flatten this whole file down. So we'll go to uh, flatten image, click okay there, it'll get rid of all of those. And then what I'm gonna do is go to image mode, and then 8-bit, so that's now converted it. You can see now it says 8-bit in this duplicate. Now when I go to that filter menu, you can see here the filter gallery is available to me. And when I click on this, brings up the filter gallery. And the one that I tend to use, let's just zoom out on that just a little bit so I can find the aircraft. There it is, zoom in. Right, now we can zoom in a bit. 
So the one I actually used is under the distort menu and it's called glass. And you can see straight away out of the out of the box there, it creates that ripple effect. Now there's some setting over, settings over on the right hand side you can use to play around with it, but these are the ones here that I've pretty much played around with to get the look that I want for the uh, exhaust heat. Now actually once you've got your settings in there, we'll click OK, that'll then send it over and you can see here it's applied the glass effect to the whole of the image, which we don't want, we only want it around the front part of the actual aircraft. So I then simply get my lasso tool from the toolbar and I make a very loose selection to say I only want that bit there. Then I get my move tool and click down directly within this selected area, click and drag that selected area off the image, go up to the top and hold my cursor over the tab containing my original 16-bit image. I'm still holding down, I bring my cursor into the image, now I hold my shift key down and keeping it held down, I then let go. And what that does, it releases the area that I copied and dragged off and by holding on a shift key it puts it in exactly the same place in this file. So you can see now look it's landed right on top of the aircraft exactly where I want it to be. So now that we've got all that exhaust there I'll then hold down my option key on Mac, alt key on Windows, click to add a layer mask, that goes black to hide it, I then get a brush with a white foreground colour making sure, let's just right click, making sure the brush is nice and soft and then I'll literally just come in and start to paint in to add that kind of effect where I want it to be on the aircraft. So something around about there, actually I don't want it too on that bit there, let's just take it off there by painting in black, it wouldn't be in front of the actual uh, engine but you can see there, so zooming in, you can see now we've got that effect on the bodywork, over the exhaust where all the heat's coming on and now again we can turn on the propellers and there you go. So that's how I do that but talking of the propellers this is how I do it. This is just a simple blank document. What I'll do is add a new uh, blank layer making sure that my foreground colour is black because that's the colour that I want the propellers to be. I'll then come to the shape tool on the toolbar pressing U on the keyboard as the keyboard shortcut and I'm going to choose triangle. Now when you do this just make sure in the top in the options bar that where you've got the options of shape, path or pixels, make sure you have it set to pixels. And then to create the propellers, one way that I've kind of figured out how to do it was to click and drag down to make a, a triangle, a shape, something like that. And by being pixels, it fills it in with your foreground colour. Then what we'll do is I'll hold down the Command key on Mac or Control key on Windows and press J to create a copy. As you can see now, there's two copies over here in the layer stack. We'll go to Edit and we'll go Transform, uh, Flip Vertical, hold down my Shift key, get my Move tool from the toolbar, that's it, my Move tool, and we'll click and drag it up like so, something like that. Now it might be that you want your propellers to be completely uh, vertical like this, you might want them angled off slightly. So what you need to do now is create a merged copy of these two propellers because you need to spin them and you can't spin these layers individually, you want them to be spun as, as like a full propeller. So the first thing we need to do is to turn off the background layer. And the reason for that is because this background layer is solid white. Now we don't want there to be solid white around our propellers, we want it to be transparent so that we can drop it on top of an aircraft. Once we've done that, we've then got the two layers with the upper layer highlighted. Hold On Mac, hold down the Shift, Option, Command and E. On Windows, Shift, Alt, Control and E and that will create a merged layer. Let's just call that merged. So you can see now by me turning these two off underneath, where we, there we have our combined propellers. So now we'll go to the filter menu, blur gallery and spin blur. And then this little uh, transform handles here, this kind of area dictating what areas are going to be spun, we need to make sure that they are dragged out to include all of the propeller. So rather than making it just to the top, you can see it still leaves a little bit there because it's a feathered edge, nice and hard. So we need to take it outside of that, so it smooths down the actual outside of the blade. And you can see there that it actually rounds it off like it would be for a real propeller. So we'll do that up there. We also need to drag these out to the left to make sure that we go round in a circle. Something like that. Once you've got that in place, over on the right hand side you've got blur angle. 
and then you can start to increase that depending on how much you want that propeller to be spinning so we'll go for something like um, something like that will be good click OK and now you can see we've got our propeller if I just turn on that background layer there you can see what we've got now what I tend to do once I've actually got it is lower the opacity down to maybe 60% 50% or whatever depending on the image that I'm doing it in but you could also now come in you could come into the free transform and then bring your cursor outside of the transform and click and drag to rotate it whatever kind of starting point you want for your propellers to be uh, you could also let's just take it back to there now that if you had an aircraft coming straight onto you these would be fine but sometimes if we go to uh, Lightroom let's have a quick look here can you see how the angle of the aircraft is going up so the propellers will be a different angle as they would be in this picture here a slightly different angle so the way we can do that is just by going to the edit menu and we'll go to transform and we go to perspective and by doing this here we can change the kind of uh, angle that looks like the propellers are moving in so we'll go for something like that let's go for right click and scale it down just a little bit so something like that so now you can see it almost appears like the, the uh, aircraft is coming at a different angle the propellers are slightly different angled depending on which direction you've got the aircraft going so you can kind of just match it to uh, so that or sort of change the perspective so that it suits the angle of the aircraft that you photographed. Um, right, I think that's it. That's enough for that one. All right, so uh, I was just looking across, and as well, we've got a question here uh, from Luke. Luke's put, "Could you not do this with the pattern option?" Luke, to be honest with you, I've never never really bothered with that. I mean, the great thing is in Photoshop, you, there's so many different ways of doing it you've got me intrigued now I might go and have a look at that and if you can it might be a good one to try I don't know if you can still do the perspective change in it but I'm willing to look but if there's more steps I don't know we'll have a look uh, I'll, I'll have a bit of a play with that um, cool so I hope that's useful just little things the great thing about Photoshop is all these little techniques that we we kind of learn it doesn't mean to say that they are only for those specific kind of pictures you kind of pick up these little tips and techniques and go actually that would work really well on whatever picture I'm doing you know a different kind of picture so as the title of a good book says it's the Photoshop toolbox you put all these little techniques into a box that you can maybe use later on I don't know um, let's have a look here Jerry Jerry I love you <laughs> for you to say are these model airplanes that yes they are and thank you very much for asking that's a, that's kind of uh, yeah, that's a, that's nice of you to say that because I want these are little airfix things. I mean, I'd started doing these on lockdown because I couldn't go out, so I got myself some airfix models, which I never did as a kid, and they're only like five or six inches wide. Glued them together um, with way too much glue. My painting was awful, but the great thing was because I was photographing them and then creating these aviation type uh, digital paintings is what I wanted to do. I could tidy them all up. But Jerry, thank you so much for asking. That is, uh, I'm going to take that as a compliment, actually. Right, let's have, um, yeah, Luke, I do know what you mean. Right, let's just have a bit of a break from my voice in a, in a moment, only for a couple of minutes, because I want to just let you know again, I know I've mentioned this for the last couple of weeks, but it starts tomorrow. The Photoshop Summit starts tomorrow, uh, and I believe that tomorrow midday um, Eastern time, US, uh, which is about five o'clock our time in the UK, it's um, uh, the early bird pricing, $97. It's, for, it's a free event anyway, but if you wanted to have everything, all of the you know the downloads the keep the files forever the, the videos forever and all that kind of stuff that comes with it there's an early bird price which finishes tomorrow at midday uh, so that's that but let me just play you uh, a little video it's only like two minutes long that's all it is dave cross because we've had a couple of questions from people asking well what do you get where do i find all the stuff that you get if you do go for the vip part so let me play you that and then we're going to look at some of the time lapses that came in and then i want to show you this focus stacking so let me just uh, let you have a listen to dave for a couple of minutes Hi, Dave Cross here. Just wanted to give you a quick view of what it looks like inside the VIP member area. If you purchase a VIP pass to the Photoshop Virtual Summit 2, I want to show you what it looks like by showing you a glimpse at the VIP area from the last summit in April. Let's take a look. Once you log in, you get to this home area, and on the top, there's the ability to search and change your profile as well as look at a site map and there's even a support option. We can look at the overall class schedule and then also look at the individual classes. So as I look down, 
you can see these check marks here that indicates classes that I've already looked at. But let's go back to this one because I'm sure it, hopefully it'd be pretty good. So you can see on this page, here's a typical example of what it looks like. Here's the class recording that I can watch the video. There's an audio recording I can download. Shows me the website of the instructor. And here's a PDF file I can download with class notes. Now some of them you'll also notice files that are available as well. So let's go look at Ben's class. You can see in this case he actually added a bonus class that's available only to VIP members. And then here's an example of where you can download the practice files. And let's look at one more. Same thing, here's the class, here's the audio recording as well as the files you can download. And I think this is such a great class, I'm going to actually add it to my favorites. So now, when I'm logged into my VIP area, among other things, I can see a list of the classes that I have identified as being my favorites. You also notice there's the ability to comment at the bottom of each class page. I get notifications when those comments come in. I do my best to keep up with them and forward them to instructors. Many of the instructors also log in themselves to see what comments are on their page. So I want to just give you a quick idea. I think you can see it's a really nice way to look at all the courses as well as have one central place to find all the downloads that are available as well. So that's it, the VIP area for the Photoshop Virtual Summit 2. Cool. So I thought I'd just drop that in there. Uh, Dave sent that over to me yesterday. If you want to know the link for the uh, Photoshop Summit, it's in the description uh, for this particular video. But before we look at the time lapses, I've got I noticed something's come through here. A couple of questions. Uh, we've got uh, John Ross has put, could you make a brush for the props? Absolutely, John. You definitely, definitely could. Uh, when you first make it, and you'll know in that little bit that I showed you there where you've got the white background, if you leave that white background there and then go to the uh, edit menu, define brush, you can then make a, a, a sort of brush out of that prop, which would be fantastic. So you could make brushes that have got two, three or four props on them, dab them down on a separate layer and then do that perspective change. So yeah, great question there, John. Um, uh, John Woolgers put, I hate to say this, but spits have three or four blade props. Yeah, I know they do. I know they do, John. And you've noticed the pictures. Here we go. We've got, uh, let's see if you can kind of see them here. Spitfire with three props. There you go. Just so, just so you can see, I'm kind of I'm kind of getting there. I'm kind of, you know, I've, uh, I'm a huge fan of the Spitfire. So that was just, John, that was just a way to show that here's how you make props. I duplicated one and then combined them and spun them. But if you're looking at an aircraft that maybe has got three or four props, you just make, you know, the couple and space them out and then combine them and then spin them is basically what you do. Uh, Alan Dunn, let's have a quick look here. Alan's put, hi Glenn, uh, will this be up online later to watch that later date? I'll put 4 a.m. tonight. So can Absolutely, Alan. Yes, it will be. I'll get the link out to everybody anyway so they can watch it, whatever. Uh, and Peggy O'Brien, I got my VIP ticket. Fantastic. You are going to love it. I cannot wait. I know it's, you're kind of biased about your own uh, stuff that you record, aren't you? But the power session I've recorded, there's a part in there where you can get Photoshop to do so much for you so quickly and you don't even ask it to do it. You only tell it once, and then from then on, it'll do all this stuff all It is incredible, really, really incredible. Uh, so John, don't apologize. Don't apologize. <laughs> do not apologize. Um, yeah, don't apologize. <laughs> it's a good question, all right? It's a good question. All right, so let me now dive in. I wanna talk about, the, show you some of these um, micros. How did, I'll quickly dive into here. I wanna make sure I answer these for you folks. How did you add the yellow tips to the props? Yeah, because on one of them I actually did. Let's ask, which one was it? Was it this one? Yeah, that one there. Um, do you know all that was, was just a case of once you'd done that uh, initial black uh, triangle for the prop, I then got another shape and kind of made a small rectangle, put it at the bottom of it, filled it with yellow, and then merged them all together. That's all it was. And then when I made more props, just duplicated that, rotated them, and so on. So, or you could you could quite happily just get a brush with a yellow color and just dab it across the bottom. Because when you blur it, you're not gonna notice exactly what shape it was to start off with. So, uh, that's that, cool. Um, right, okay, let's have a look at some of these uh, time lapses. Because you remember, if you tuned into last week, I said, uh, let's have a bit of a time lapse challenge. And it was lovely that some folks sent them in. 
uh, and I've got some of the ones that sent in. One initially was sent in by a guy called Brian Lee. I think Brian's actually in the in the chat room. Uh, very, very timely time lapse that he did with today being Remembrance Sunday uh, in the UK. So I'm going to play this one quickly for you now from Brian. Absolutely love that. Really, really good. And I think Brian's actually said that's at Blenheim Palace, which was opposite where the first exhibition was for the uh, portraits project that I did. So I might have to go and have a look at that, but we are on lockdown. Maybe I can use that place as some exercise. I don't know. Uh, right, the next one here, this is from Jack Britton. And Jack, if you're watching this, I've just got to make an apology. Is that I know you sent me two versions over, uh, one with and one without music. I couldn't play the one with the music because it's uh, copyrighted and I don't want to risk getting a uh, strike out on the uh, on YouTube. So this is uh, this is uh, Jack Britton's. It's called this one he called Mud Lake. Clouds over Mud Lake. These things are such fun to do. The next one is by uh, Will Rose and I'd be really interested to know those of you who sent them in have you ever done them before? Or was it actually the tutorial last week that kind of helped out? It'd be nice to know if that was the case. Uh, but this one is by uh, Will Rose. I like this one because I like the truck. Love them clouds, look at them. I might have to freeze frame some of this and nick some of them clouds for a picture. All right. <laughs> Next one is my good mate, Anthony Crothers, who's actually in the room, one of the moderators, along with my other mate, Brian Dukes. Uh, actually, before I play this one, just so you know, again, I've put quite a lot of stuff in the description part of the video. Uh, do us a favor, when we finish with this, check out the description part, look at some of the links I've put in there, because I've put one to Anthony, uh, who's got a, um, Anthony's put together quite a few of these PDFs for sort of like beginner photography, talking about composition and all sorts of stuff. They're really, really cool stuff. So check out those. You can go to like a landing page and I would highly recommend because he's, he's one of those people who's doing stuff for the right reasons. Join his email community and you'll be able to get hold of these PDFs and loads of other stuff that I know he's working on. So definitely check that out. But this is Anthony's uh, uh, sorry, time lapse. I love that. I love that. I had my volume really high up when I played that. We're not expecting it to have that, but uh, yeah, nice one, Anthony. This one here is from uh, Chris Hunt. This is a place, some called Aracy Plantation. And I've got to go to this place because it looks really cool. I do like, I do like that place. Very, very nice. What's that saying? Let's have a quick look here. Uh, let's just dive back up. We've got Will saying, I'll send a few raw files of clouds. Will, please do. You can never have enough clouds. <laughs> and then which one we've got here? We've got, uh, that was uh, Chris Hunt. Right, this one here, Tim Burgess. And this is very aptly called From My Window. I would, I would suggest if anybody lives near to uh, to Tim, just be mindful of what you're up to because he's got his camera out the window filming you. And then this uh, this last one here was by a guy called John McNairn. Now this actually is not a is not a time lapse, although that sounds kind of a bit weird. John put together a time lapse photographing the stars and a ne the nebula, whatever you call it, nebula, and he created this final image. And I want to show the image first, uh, and then I want to kind of just some, show something else as well. But this is John's picture, which I think. I, I love it. I love this kind of stuff. I've never done this before, all this kind of photographing the stars and the nebula, but I think why not do it or start to do it now, seeing as I'm, you know, moved to Devon. We've got Exmoor, we've got Dartmoor, we've got all those kind of places. But what I did, because I, I just loved it and I'm really fascinated by this stuff, I, I got the email from John with the picture. So I emailed John back and said, look, would you be, are you, are you okay if I give you a shout? Maybe we can have a bit of a video chat and maybe record it. So I asked John, you know, what kit was he using? Because he told me this was only, the, I think, the second time he'd ever done this. And because of the lockdown, he's kind of, it's made to, you know, go out and try different things, which is great. 
He told me that he was using a 70 to 200 mil lens. Uh, didn't use a huge lens, like a 600 mil, because he was finding that when he did it, he noticed that because of the size of it and what he was putting it on, you could see movement. And obviously with the stars that distance away, that slight movement's gonna be really exaggerated. So he used a 70 to 200 mil lens, uh, f2.8 and a one second exposure on the time lapse. But let me just play you a short video. I was asking him about the, how on earth do you focus on a star when you're doing this kind of stuff. So here's a here's a, just a snippet from when me and John had a bit of a video chat last night. First time I'd ever kind of done this with him, but uh, he was very gracious for me to give him a shout. And that was what about what about what about your focus point, John? Because that's something else that's kind of like where the where the hell do you focus? Right, there's that's a good bet. So I forgot all about that actually. <laughs> well <laughs> <spotted>. <laughs> you're speaking to a numpty. I don't know anything about yeah, yeah. this, mate. <laughs> well, what ha what you do is you pick it a star any star on Mars or, or, or whatever. And um, the way to focus it is to go into live view, focus on whichever star you're looking at or, or, or whichever one you want. Go into live view and you can't really see the star as such as, as a star or Mars as a planet. What you're trying to do is minimize the size of the star so if, it's, if a star is blurred, it's quite large. As it comes into focus, the star goes smaller. So you move the focus until the star's at its smallest point, and that's when you know it's in focus. I thought that was fascinating, but uh, there's, there's some other comments coming in. Thank you to John as well for his time with that one. Uh, Deb, lovely lady, she's put down for Milky Way. Highly recommend checking out Eric Kuna. Yeah, Eric Kuna is one of the guys at uh, Kelby. He's got some incredible space kind of uh, pictures, you know, really has, and also the shuttle and stuff like that. So he's got some amazing pictures to do with that. And here you go, Sizzle Monkey Productions. You should join the Astrophotography for Beginners Facebook group. I will. I will do that. I'm just fascinated to kind of try give this stuff a try. Just see what uh, see what I can do. I think it's always good to learn more stuff, especially with the situation we're currently in. So yeah, I know that uh, Scott Kelby's book, the Landscape Photography book. He doesn't know I'm mentioning this, but uh, in there there's a, a really good advice for how to go about doing it and how some lenses have a, a certain point you can turn them to, which means they are going to be already automatically set to focus on infinity. So it's worth checking that out. Uh, and what else was I going to say? Oh yeah, John, very kindly, after we'd had that chat, he emailed me with a number of links uh, to places where you can uh, check out this kind of stuff, what kit he used, did, what kit he used. also um, applications you can use for blending all the pictures together. And also I've put in there John's uh, website as well. He's got some really cool work. Not safe for work, some of it, bit of nudity in there, but it is very, very cool stuff. So I've put those links in the description as well. Uh, right, let me just uh, dive in. I want to very, suddenly, just a few minutes this will take, just to show you the stacking. You might remember from last week when we did the Mustang picture, I talked about how uh, we can use uh, stacking to kind of blend in pictures whereby we, uh, let's say for example, we're, you're a landscape photographer, and rather than focusing on one point within the actual picture, and that being nice and in focus, and then other areas being out of focus, you might want it so that the foreground, the middle ground, and the background are in focus. And to do that, you'd need to take three pictures and blend them together, and that'd be called focus stacking. Now that's something I had to do when I was photographing the model aircraft because of the, the kind of you know short distance I'm away from them, no matter what aperture I used, if I focused on a part of the aircraft, there would be another part out of focus. So I had to focus on three parts of the aircraft to make sure that they were in focus and then blend them together. But I'll, I'll kind of show you what I mean by it now. So if we dive over, it's only a few minutes this will take and, and you'll see what I mean about focus stacking. All right, so the photographs I've taken here for the final uh, Spitfire picture, Obviously they're taken on the table on this mini tripod with this background here actually being on a monitor so I know how to position the plane. But if I zoom in you can see that each picture um, has got certain areas in focus like this one here has got the front with the propellers and this part of the engine and this front part of the wing in focus. Then the next picture shows it where it's got uh, the middle part of the aircraft in focus which also includes this wing up here now, that's nice and sharp. And then the third and final picture is where the, all the front and middle of the aircraft is out of focus, but the main part that's in focus is the tail. Obviously, now we need to blend these together to make it one final image. So what we'll do in the um, film strip at the bottom, 
we'll highlight all of the images and we'll go to photo menu, photo edit in, open as layers in Photoshop. That's now going to send all three of these images into Photoshop, but rather than opening them in three separate tabs across the top of the screen, it's going to open up in one tab with all of the images stacked on top of each other in the layer stack, like you can see now. So if I turn the first two off, we can here's the base layer, and then we turn on the second one, a little bit of movement in it, and a little bit of movement in that one as well, even though I was on a tripod. Now last week when you saw me talking about the Mustang picture where there were loads of images in the layer stack, when I sort of uh, lined them all up, I did it off the base layer. Now what I found with it, Photoshop works really, really well lining images up when there's only a few, okay? The Mustang uh, image, there was loads, so I actually worked off the base layer. But this one here is fine. The only thing I make sure I do is the first layer in the layer stack, I'm going to lock that so that's definitely not moving. And so the other remaining two layers here, which isn't much processing for Photoshop to do, is going to base them all on this particular layer here, how to line it all up. So we'll make sure they're all highlighted. We'll then go to the uh, Edit menu, Auto Align Layers. We don't need to change anything in the default. We'll click OK. Takes a little bit of time, a little bit of a spinny thing. The old progress bar zips along, and then all of a sudden, let's just turn the top two off. So now you can see, turn the next one on, no movement. Turn the next one on, no movement. So they're all lined up. Now all I need to do now to blend it all together so that we have one image where the whole of the aircraft is in focus is go back to that edit menu and choose auto blend layers. Real simple dialog box here. I choose the stack images option and I'm going to make sure there's a tick where it says seamless tones and colors. And then I'm just going to simply click OK. We've got this progress bar zipping along. Photoshop is now looking at all of these layers here and it's working out which layer contains parts that have got, or which part of that layer contains elements that are in focus. It's going to look through all of them and it's going to only use those bits to create one final image rather than including anything that's out of focus. So let's just wait for this to zip along so you've seen this in real time. Quite big images, you can see at the bottom left hand corner, the actual, whoops, the, let's just get rid of that. The actual full size is 1.08 gigabytes it's working on, but now it's done it. So you can see there's a lot of activity happening in the layers panel. If I now zoom in on the aircraft, you can see that we have the front props all in focus. We've got the middle of the aircraft in focus. We've got this wing here in focus and this wing and also way at the back, that's also in focus as well. So Photoshop has taken all the in focus elements of each of these layers and then just basically masked out the bits that aren't in focus uh, so that we can just have one final image. So really clever stuff, focus stacking, definitely needed to do it on this image and it's just something that a lot of landscape photographers do when they want their landscape pictures to be in sharp and in focus in the foreground, the middle ground and the background. Uh, it's such a cool technique to be able to do that and I can't wait until I do uh, kickstart again my landscaping stuff to try it out on the landscape. So it'd be really interesting to do that. But there's some questions come in, to, come in from that one there. Let's have a quick look here. Uh, Anthony's put, uh, did you use a macro lens for photographing them? Mate, if I, if I had one, yeah. But uh, I think Mark's got it right. It was, uh, it was definitely, it was the 85 mil. That G Master, which is on the shelf just there behind me, it is so, so sharp. That's the one that I uh, ended up using for it. Uh, and Leon Flax put, how many, how do you determine uh, or judge how many photos to take? Leon, do you know, that's a, that's a really good question. And, and I've kind of photographed these at F4. I've photographed them at F11. You've got to be really careful because I'm doing it indoors. And the way I was lighting them was positioning them by the window. So I was getting natural lighting. So I couldn't necessarily shoot at F11 because everything was getting too dark. And if I boost up the ISO, it was getting too noisy. So I had to kind of play around with a, a wider open aperture. And the only way of judging it, uh, and this is where tethering comes in really handy, is because I focus on the props, first of all. And then you'll look at the picture coming in onto the laptop and go, right, what, and when I focus on the props, what else is in focus? And if that means that wing there is in focus, I know I know don't need to take a shot, but this one here isn't. So then I'll position the focus point on that wing and do another one. Then I'll go to the middle, take a shot, look around, what else needs to be done, and then finish off by putting the focus point in other areas that I've seen out of all the pictures I've taken so far, need to be in focus. So that one there was three. There was a horse glider that I did, a bit bigger. I think that took about five or six. So it's just a case of slowing down, taking a photo, looking and assessing, right, what else needs to be photographed to be taken in, uh, to make it sure it's nice and sharp for them to be blended together. 
Uh, let's have a look here. Uh, what's holding the model to the tripod? Blue tack. <laughs> That's all it is. Just a tabletop tripod and a big wadge of uh, blue tack underneath. Some people said when I was doing this, why not just hang it with fishing wire like we used to do as kids from the ceiling and do all this kind of stuff. The reason was was because it was just that was just too much effort for me to cut lengths of fishing wire, the right length to position the plane at the right angle. Nah, just put it on the tripod, bit of blue tack, and then I can use that ball head to rotate the plane and angle it how I want it to be. And the reason I photographed it against what was going to be the final background, but I had that on the screen behind, was then I could actually judge how to angle the plane against that background, what would look right. So that's, that's tended why I did that particular way. Um, boom, 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 boom. What else got? Um, Mark's put, Glenn, would you not think about radial blur on the propeller or is that too much of a faff? Uh, Mark, you could do. Yeah, you you maybe could do, but I think because the um, the spin blur was a more updated version, it just seemed to work better. Radial blur is the one that people used to use for years to make it look as if tires were spinning, and it didn't really work that well. Um, so that's that. Uh, radial blur. So radial blur is hard work. It is difficult to make it. Yeah, Ian Porter. Yeah, I I agree. I I do I do tend to agree. Cool. Um, there you go. So that's that. Um, I've kind of. It's, Let's just pull this off here. I've kind of gone through my to-do list with you. I wanted to do this one tonight, even though we are right in the middle of everything with having moved and there's still some stuff here to take down. I wanted to keep this going because with us now being on this second lockdown and it, you're hearing, hearing about it all over the world, different things happening. I've said it before. I think these communities are really, really important. Do you know, I'm really, really important. And it's great just seeing the amount of chat going on in that chat room and people kind of, you know, getting to meet each other virtually, I think is fantastic. Uh, John Walger, plenty to think now during lockdown two. Yeah, you're not wrong, John. Um, yeah, I'm halfway through some doing some model aircraft. I've, but you know, I've actually got a box full of the insides of model aircraft because I only ever do the outsides. And when I remember not to, I never put the propeller on when I'm making them because otherwise... I've got to kind of, I prefer to make my own and then put it on rather than try to spin one that's already on there, if that makes sense. Uh, but that's that. That's enough from me. Um, I'm going to leave you with, a, as it's Remembrance Sunday, I'm going to leave you with a very, very short video as we kind of play this one out. David Edwards, when I interviewed World War II veteran David Edwards, who hasn't been too well lately, if I'm honest. Uh, he's, not, he's, not, um, he's not the best at the moment, uh, but he's such a lovely man. Uh, such a lovely man. Lives in Abergavenny. Uh, in Wales. So I'm going to play a very short video. Have a listen to it. Because when I spoke to David after I'd done his photograph and he was talking about how when he first joined the army, his dad uh, told him to get a haircut before he goes in because that'll help. He'll get in the good books. But uh, I'll leave that with you, folks. Thank you so much for uh, tuning in tonight. I hope that's been useful in some way, shape or form. And I will let you know when there'll be the next one, which should be in a week's time. But uh, look after yourselves. Take care. Do what you got to do. And I'll see you next time. Before I went to the army, my father, who was in the army, he was a sergeant in the Monmouthshire Regiment for quite a long time. And he said to me, before you go, Dave, get yourself a haircut. And so religiously, I went to the barbers and I had what in those days was called a short back and sides. And I had this haircut and it was short back and sides, where they cut it up to there, and very short. And I mon prayed with the Monmouth Regiment. Was it the Mons or was I in training? Anyway, I was on parade and a lot of young fellas like me were there. And the the corporal, I, I think he was a corporal, he had a big stick they used to put under their left arm and strut about everywhere giving orders. And he came along and he said, when I touches you on the shoulder, with my stick, it means Eckert. And I thought, oh, I'm, I stood there in the line and I thought, oh, Dad was right. Yeah, that was clever. That was sensible, telling me. And I've had one, so I'm okay. Suddenly the stick comes down on my shoulder from behind. Eckert, he growled, you know, Eckert. And I made a mistake and I turned and I said, 
I had one yesterday, Corporal. Oh, did you have one yesterday? Oh, I see you had one yesterday. You'll have another one, a bloody proper one. <laughs> That's how they thought haircuts were important, you know. So I marched off with this group, and there was one chap, they called him Curly, and he was, he was Curly. And he stood with us, and he stood in front of us, I can see that stick now. He was brandishing it and putting it back under his arm and all that. And he said, Thompson, I think his name was Thompson. Thompson, you were first. And Thompson goes, and he came out and it was all, everything, all the curls and everything. Brilliant. Brilliant. <laughs> <laughs>Thanks so much for the lovely uh, comments, folks. I'm just about to pull the plug, but um, I just wanted to make sure you saw the end of that. So uh, like I said, take care of yourselves, do what you got to do, and I'll see you in about a week's time.